Hello, everybody. I'm Manu Santhanam, Professor and Head of Department of Civil Engineering at IIT Madras. And I'm going to talk to you today about future cement solutions for tropical climatic conditions. I'd like to first thank the organizers of ICCMS 2021 for giving me this opportunity to interact with you. So the outline for my presentation goes something like this. I'll first talk about what are the challenges of construction in the tropics. I'll then present some alternatives that we have for supplementary cementing materials around the world primarily limestone as uh, a supplementary material, limestone in combination with other supplementary materials as a replacement for cement. And finally, we'll also look at agricultural ashes. So my intention today is to try and bring out some aspects of the characterization of these materials and the performance characteristics that you can expect in concrete when such materials are used. Now, what are the primary challenges of construction in the tropics? Of course, I'm talking about a very large part of the world, a vast belt, which is tropical. We all know that corrosion is a primary concern in all tropical climates, especially in coastal areas. But beyond that also, there are a lot of issues. If you look at the geography of the world, most of the countries that are situated in the tropical regions are the emerging economies, or as in the old days, we used to call them developing countries. So these are dealing with a lot of challenges and construction is just one of them, right? So because of these challenges that are outside of the technical realm of construction, there are a lot of impacts that are felt by the construction industry also. So what are some of these impacts and how is construction difficult in tropical conditions? First of all, of course, the condition itself is quite difficult in which you do the construction. You expect in most of these cases, very high heat and humidity, and that pushes up the problems of concreting and also the rate at which deterioration happens in structures. We know that there's a long coastline in many of these tropical countries, and that pushes up the possibility of chloride-related issues, which, of course, in India, we experience a lot of that in the coastal regions. Then, of course, in general, in most of the emerging economies, uh, India, no exception to it, there is a general reluctance to move towards blended cementitious systems. Although in reality, in the market today, you don't really get any ordinary portal cement for general purpose use, but still in infrastructure projects, you see that OPC is still the material of choice. There is not that much emphasis given in infrastructure projects of using supplementary materials and unless there is a suitable research project that goes into actually doing the mixed design. The material specifications that you find in most of the jobs that are undertaken seem to be outdated. They are still dealing with materials and the characteristics of materials from way in the past. Whereas if you really look at it, as far as construction engineering is concerned, the technology of materials has expanded or enhanced significantly over the past 10 to 20 years. And reflecting all these in our current practices is very important for us to get the most out of these materials. There are often quality and consistency issues with site materials. You never usually get a complete project done with perfect material. You always have some issues once in a while of poor quality material, which ultimately uh, uh, puts in a spoke in your wheel, right? Or breaks the entire chain of uh, uh, the smooth flow of your project itself can be broken because of the poor quality of materials that you deal with once in a while, right? Especially when you're dealing with these supplementary materials, like for instance, fly ash, there is often a chance that you deal with high variability in the material and putting together consistency tests and checks on this material during the construction project is absolutely important. And the other problem which I've seen in common in most of the construction sites is that the design for the concrete mixture is not undertaken early enough. People don't really do the mix design early enough to understand what are the possibilities of this concrete, what are the characteristics of this concrete that are likely to affect the performance of the structure, and how do we ensure that we are actually giving the best possible combination of materials for the given exposure environment and for the kind of conditions that this concrete is going to be exposed to through its lifetime. Right. So very often we do this at the last minute because people don't seem to think concrete is very important, to tell you the truth. Unfortunately, a lot of the problems that you deal with on site are concrete related, and these can be avoided by ensuring that you pay particular attention to the mixed design process of the concrete. Now, in general, you know very well, in most sites, there is a lack of skilled workers. Again, that's again uh, because of this thought that pervades in people's minds that 
concrete is an easy metal to work with. You don't really need specialized skills to handle it. That's actually a wrong thought in the beginning itself. One needs to correct that and ensure that there's sufficient amount of understanding of the material and the way it needs to be applied. Because of this lack of understanding, we often see that in sites, addition of water into the concrete to enhance the workability is still a very common thing to do. Quality checks on the site are infrequent. We don't really see the quality of materials being tested often to ensure that there is perfect consistency being maintained in the materials that are supplied. And as I said before, there is a reluctance to move towards blended cement and we all generally tend to rely a lot more on ordinary portal cement or plain cement. And secondly, we always believe that the strength is the ultimate characteristic that you desire in concrete. In many instances, strength is only a basic necessity that needs to be fulfilled. The actual performance is in the durability of the concrete. And that's something which we need to pay attention to a lot more. And because of the lack of importance given to concrete, the planning of concrete mixing and placing, that plays as much of a role as in the selection of the materials. As far as concrete performance is concerned, you need to ensure that you spend sufficient time in thinking about how you're going to be mixing and placing this material, how you're going to plan your compaction and curing strategies. All that is extremely important. If we are not paying attention to that, and that's what happens mostly in countries that are situated in this tropical belt, including India, of course, where we see this problem, which creates a lot of other issues as far as concrete construction is concerned. There are, of course, new challenges. Our technologies have to keep up with what are being practiced all over the world. Technology for placement, technology for curing, technologies for uh, mixing the concrete, all of those have been enhanced significantly. And of course, we also are dealing with new sets of specifications for our jobs as far as concrete is concerned. No longer are we satisfied with just doing strength. There are obviously going to be requirements of durability because these are obviously being brought in by experts who understand what durability is all about. And this is the kind of concrete that is needed for a particular service environment. So as a result, we now have new specifications and we really need to understand the requirements as far as concrete is concerned. And in general, costs of construction are going up. Of course, the COVID has not really helped that. You, you've probably seen in the papers that the cost of materials also has gone up significantly in in the post-COVID era. Availability of labor is always a good uh, major challenge because labor force, as far as construction is concerned, is always mobile. They're also always looking for better opportunities and they keep shifting from place to place. And really, in many cases, the training that is given to much of the labor is not really uh, fructified in the labor staying and working through the duration of the project. Good quality water is a major challenge in many construction sites, especially because concrete requires water, not just for the mixing, but also for the curing. And as a result, you now really have to think about how best you can utilize the available water or reduce the amount of water that you use in concrete and also provide for alternative methods of curing. In the future, we are going to deal a lot more with availability of aggregates. It's not so far been a major challenge, but there are locations where it can be a challenge even today. But in the future, we are certainly going to see major challenges with respect to good quality aggregate being available. And probably in the foreseeable future, we can also start seeing that cement stocks keep dwindling and we will be having to rely a lot more on alternative materials because cement itself is a commodity that is requiring the use of limestone for its manufacture. And the stock of limestone around the world is dwindling as the time passes. And estimates say that the limestone stock if you are using only ordinary potent cement, that limestone stock may just be enough for providing for about 50 years of ordinary potent cement. That shows you very clearly that we really need to move towards alternative solutions. So what are these alternative solutions? Obviously, I'm driving home the point that we need to use more and more supplementary cementing materials in the concrete. Supplementary cementing materials like fly ash, slag, silica fume, metacaolin, right? All of these can prolong the life of the raw materials needed for cement manufacture, you can extend the reserves of your limestone to cover for 100 years, 150 years, instead of completely exhausting them in 50 years. Many supplementary cementing materials are also byproducts or what we sometimes call them as waste products from other industries. And as a result, by utilizing them in concrete, we are actually doing a major uh, positive 
change for the environment, right? So environmental and econo economic benefits are obviously going to be tremendous when we start using uh, supplementary materials. And specifically, SCMs can lead to enhancement of very specific characteristics of the concrete that cannot be achieved by simply using Portland cement alone. So just if you evaluate the impact of supplementary materials as per this sustainability triple bottom line of providing for economic, social, and environmental benefits, you see that in all the boxes, you get tick marks when you actually think about the use of SEMs and concrete because you are using waste or byproducts and reducing the amount of cement to be used. You obviously have an environmental benefit, right? Because cement contributes a lot to the overall greenhouse gas emissions. Socially, you are producing a concrete that is going to be lasting for a longer time. Durability is high as a result of which you have the potential for structures being around or in service for a longer period of time that obviously will have a major social impact. And that will also have an impact on the economy because the benefit to cost ratio is going to be far exceeding that you can get from just ordinary Portland cement based concrete, especially when you're talking about chloride related problems where it has been shown by years and years of research that use of supplementary cementing materials is a major, major thing to do to improve your resistance to corrosion. Right. So what are these supplementary materials doing? Primarily, these materials consist of amorphous silica, right? And this amorphous silica basically combines with uh, calcium hydroxide from cement hydration to form additional calcium silicate hydrate. That's the primary impact of supplementary materials. But I'll show you as the lecture progresses that you can have some secondary impacts also. Formation of other products sometimes also happens and this leads to a complete filling up of the pore structure and that ultimately leads to the better durability. So what are the properties that we are looking for as far as the use of SCMs is concerned? Sometimes we want to lower the heat of hydration. For instance, when we are doing mass concrete structures, we want to keep the heat of hydration as low as possible. Instead of going for special cements that are difficult to manufacture, what you can simply do is reduce the content of cement by using supplementary material. Workability, of course, can be changed or can be adversely affected depending upon the type of supplementary material that you have. The structure of the SCM, the fineness and the reactivity can lead to different effects as far as workability is concerned. Generally, silica fume or calcine clays can give you problems of workability, whereas fly ash gives you an enhancement of the workability and slag does not really affect it significantly. Strength development is generally slower because obviously the pozzolanic materials or supplementary materials need this calcium hydroxide that is getting generated. So it takes a very while for them to really get going. As a result, you may have to sometimes do a longer curing, especially when you have fly ash or slag. If you have calcine clays, you probably don't need to do that because the reaction is relatively faster. And if you do this good curing, you generally expect that the durability of concrete produced with supplementary materials is going to be significantly better than with ordinary potent cement concrete. Now, there are obviously challenges. I mean, I know that SEMs are a good solution to enhancing durability of the concrete, but challenges involve overcoming the variability of which I already talked about, especially things like fly ash. You can have extensive amount of variability in the quality of fly ash, even sometimes from the same source. Availability, determination of availability is very important because one needs to establish whether it makes economic sense to actually bring in the SEM or supplementary material from a certain distance to your construction site to use in your concrete. It has to make economic sense. Otherwise, there's probably not going to be usage of these materials. Secondly, the availability in the form that is ready to use is important. Sometimes you need processing of the SEMs. You need to probably grind them further. You sometimes need to burn them further and so on and so forth, as a result of which that processing may enhance the cost and also lead to further CO2 and energy emissions. So you need to ensure that you are uh, basically taking care of that aspect also in your overall calculations. Okay. Now, the other issue is availability can be fairly local for certain types of supplementary materials. You need to establish the properties in such a way that you identify sources that are locally available and sources of supplementary materials that could be globally available. Just let's look at this in a slightly bigger way. So I'll present some local and global options in my talk today. So I'll talk primarily about limestone as an additive. 
And you know very well that limestone is the primary raw material for manufacture of cement. So it is a global solution to a supplementary cementing material. Because limestone is going to be available anywhere that cement is manufactured, right? Now, calcine clays can present a very nice alternative to the use of something like fly ash, which is very slow to react, whereas calcine clays tend to react much faster. But recent research at IIT Madras and elsewhere in the world has shown very clearly that combinations of limestone and calcine clay as a large volume replacement of the cement can still produce excellent properties of the concrete. And finally, I'll talk about another option, agricultural ashes, which is more of a local option. Limestone and clays can be available all around the world, but agricultural ashes obviously are locally confined to locations where you actually practice the specific uh, growing of the specific species, which leads to the ash, and that forms the crux of the uh, work that we've done here. We have looked primarily at sugarcane bagasse ash in the research work that we've done at IIT Madras, and that's what I'll be sharing with you in the latest slides. But first, let's take an overall global outlook at the availability of cementitious materials. There is obviously going to be a reduction or lesser amount of supplementary materials available as compared to clinker, because clinker depends on limestone. Limestone is available in plenty, but we don't want to use all of that limestone. Secondly, we cannot use all of that limestone. Please mind you, if you look at the Indian statistics also, nearly 90% of the limestone that is there in India, limestone reserve that is available in India, nearly 90% of that you cannot utilize in one form or the other because it's present in reserve forests. You can't really mine this material. Only 10% is available for mining. And among that 10%, only a small fraction is actually producing limestone of a quality that is good enough to manufacture cement. Okay, so these vast global reserves of limestone, some of which may not be even touched, okay? But nevertheless, limestone is there. As compared to that, obviously your supplementary materials are quite low in there, uh, 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 the amount of material that is available. Fly ash, a lot of it may be available, but quite a bit of it is of not of very good quality. Slag obviously is dependent on the steel industry, so you don't have that much available around the world. Natural puzzlelands like volcanic ashes, we don't really know because nobody has actually prospected the locations where these materials may be available in a large quantity because volcanic eruptions have happened across geological eras. And sometimes these ashes may be trapped under layers of earth that we really cannot excavate to really get through to that layer of ash. So very often this poses a problem of proper quantification. So that's why you have this arrow here. That means there is a lack of understanding as to how we can actually get an estimate of how much is available. One thing we know is available in plenty is cal uh, the clay. And clay can be calcined. If you are having a pure keolinitic clay that is calcined, you get metacholin. But you can also have clays from other, uh, calcine clays from other type of clays, like elytic clays, which may also present some very interesting options for you to consider as far as concrete is concerned. But for the most part, I'll talk only about kaolinitic clays in my talk here. But primarily what we are looking at is that one needs to understand the availability very well before proceeding with a large scale utilization of the material. So supposing I went with silica fume, as my choice of material for the future, I know that very little of it is actually available, right? And I can't really promote it in the kind of numbers that I promote fly ash or slag, because those are materials that are available in much larger quantities. So let's now look at finely ground limestone as an additive. As, as I said, since limestone is available anywhere cement is manufactured, it is certainly one of the global solutions. It obviously makes good sense for the cement industry to be using limestone as an additive in or in the cement itself. For instance, if you look at the Indian specifications for Portland cement, or many of the specifications in Europe also, deal with up to 5% cement, or up to 5% uh, replacement of the cement being allowed by limestone itself in regular Portland cement. If you, know, if you buy ordinary Portland cement, you can still have up to 5% of the cement substituted by ground limestone. We call it as a performance improver. So in reality, what it's doing is, it is reducing the cost and it is also reducing the total CO2 emitted from your cement. Per bag of cement, you are reducing the cement quantity or clinker quantity and replacing partly with limestone. So you have actually reduced the CO2 impact of the cement. Then there are countries where Portland limestone cement blends have also been 
popularized in India also the standard for Portland limestone cement is under preparation and we expect that this will also be available in the future as one of the types of cement in the industry. And here the, uh, the cement is replaced up to 6 to 20% by limestone. More popularly around the world, you have 15% replacement of clinker by limestone to make Portland limestone cement. Okay, And you, you, if you go across, if you, uh, if you see articles from Canada and Europe, you'll see that a lot of the construction projects have actually utilized Portland limestone cement for all kinds of applications. Now, sometimes it pays dividends to actually start using limestone in the ground form along with supplementary cementing materials in so-called ternary systems. Ternary means we have more than two types of binding materials available. Of course, cement is one of them. Second here is limestone. And the third is a supplementary material like fly ash or slag okay, or calcine clay because we want to maximize the reactivity of the SEM. So limestone and calcine clay as a popular combination has come across as a very important uh, substitute for cement in the last few years. Now, one can try and do concretes with limestone content exceeding more than 20% of cement replacement. But obviously what you're doing here is replacing a reactive material with a non-reactive material. And the fineness of limestone is only going to do so much for improving your concrete properties. After some time, after in increasing amounts of limestone replacement, you are obviously going to get some problems of dilution of the cementitious component and that will result in loss of strength and durability. However, there are so many applications in which concrete is used for lower grade, uh, where lower grade concrete can be utilized. For in instance, in non-structural applications like curbs, dividers, like blocks and things like that. In such places, there is no need to worry about using very plain cement or, or very uh, large amounts of ordinary Portland cement. You can go for very large levels of replacement, even with limestone that is not suitable for cement manufacture. That means the lower grade limestone that is available in the cementitious min, uh, mines, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, in the mines associated with the cement plants, you have a lot of limestone that is not suitable for cement manufacture. There's tons of it available. And this limestone can be extracted and utilized for making lower grade concretes that are good for non structural applications. Now, as I said earlier, in binary systems, that means just as a replacement of the cement, you can use it in ordinary Portland cement up to 5% as a performance improver or as a major addition in Portland limestone cement plants. What does this finely limestone, uh, ground limestone do? Finely ground limestone accelerates the hydration of the component of cement that is present in largest quantity, that is alite or C3S. Okay? C3S hydration gets accelerated in the presence of limestone. And the carbonate-based phases, see, limestone is calcium carbonate, some part of it is soluble. So the soluble carbonate can actually go ahead and react with the aluminates that are available in the cementitious material and then lead to the formation of products like carboaluminates. Again, these are solid products that are going to be occupying the volume. I'll talk about that a little bit later. right? But that is limited because, first of all, the aluminates are already busy reacting with the sulfates in cementitious systems. And uh, there's only so much of carbonate that can, that can actually dissolve. Okay? So in reality, much of this limestone simply acts as a filler. It's a non-reactive material in most of the cases and simply sits there as a filler. But then even that is actually a good performance because ultimately you're blocking the porosity. So when you start replacing with larger quantities, as much as 50%, you can still make good quality low-grade concrete. What do you mean by good quality, low grade concrete? I mean, where strength determination or strength development is not that critical and where durability uh, levels of what you require in coastal environments, you don't really need those. So for instance, when you're making blocks of bricks with concrete, why do you need such high levels of durability with blocks of bricks? You need durability in concrete because you want to protect the reinforcing steel. But in plain concrete, you don't really, really have to worry too much about that. Of course, you need to worry about efflorescence, water absorption, and things like that, but those have to be properly designed against. So what happens when limestone combines with another supplementary material? So for instance, here in the system, you have cement clinker, which is basically all the compounds of cement, C3S, C2S, C3A, and C4EF. You have SCM1, supplementary cementing material one, which basically could be your uh, fly ash or slag or calcine clay and things like that. And SCM2 is limestone, Okay, so now what happens is you have a ternary blend and you get a different chemistry here. 
What do you do here? First of all, you're reducing the cost because you're using limestone that is available already in the cement plants. You don't have to bring the supplementary material from a far off location. Secondly, what you're doing is you're converting these phases that form because of hydration of cement, which generally are slightly high density phases into a mixture of low density phases. And these low density phases include, of course, more of ettringite. You have monocarbonate, hemicarbonate, and in the long term, the supplementary metal one that is fly ash or slag or calcium clay undergoes pozzolanic reaction to produce what we call as calcium aluminum silicate hydrate. So now what you've done is you've replaced cement partially with a combination of limestone and supplementary material. The kind of reactions and the chemistry that you get in the system leads to the formation of a greater amount of solid hydration products. You know very well in concrete, the more solid hydration products that you form, the less porosity that you get. The less porosity that you get, the higher your strength goes. But that's not the end of the story. The lower the porosity, the lower is the pore connectivity also because the pores become smaller and smaller. The pore connectivity also reduces. And when pore connectivity reduces, the permeability of concrete also comes down. And when permeability comes, comes down, obviously your durability goes up. And that's the message that you need to convey when using limestone in combination with other supplementary material. So just to show you the chemistry in more detail, what really happens in normal Portland cement is shown here. You have uh, calcium hyd silicate hydrate and calcium hydroxide as the two primary products that are forming in cement hydration. You have in the long term calcium aluminate hydrate and monosulfate, which are the stable phases, whereas ettringite, which is a high volume phase, starts to diminish in the long term and converts to what we call as monosulfate. Now that's the problem in sulfate attack, what happens? When external sulfates come into contact with this monosulfate, they form ettringite. And this ettringite formation in a hardened concrete leads to volume expansions and cracking. That's something which is avoided by the use of this ternary system. So what happens here is because the sulfate now is competing with carbonate to react with the aluminate, you have the sulfates that led to the formation of ettringite remaining stable and the ettringite quantity is, does not really go down. Ettringite remains stable, so you don't really get any monosulfate formation. On the other hand, you start forming what are called monocarbonate or hemicarbonate, which are basically the reaction between carbonates and aluminates. That leads to formation of monocarboaluminate or hemicarboaluminate. So that's an additional product that you're forming. And in the long term, you're also reducing your Portlandite content and converting this to additional calcium silicate hydrate. So overall, what you're resulting in is more CSH in your system. That means more binding characteristics, smaller porosity, and as a result, you get better results as far as durability is concerned. Okay, So porosity also goes down. You have stabilization of ettringite, increased carboaluminate phases, lowered calcium hydroxide or Portlandite content and increased calcium silicate hydrate and calcium aluminum silicate hydrate, which leads to long-term durability. Now, just to show the effect of this ternary combination, we did this comparative mixed designs of concrete in our laboratory with typical structural grades of M30 and M50. We made concretes with OPC, plain ordinary Portland cement, 30% fly ash replaced Portland cement, and this binder, which we call as LC3, limestone, calcine clay cement. So what we do is we have 15% limestone, 30% calcine clay, right? And 50% of cement clinker along with gypsum to make the LC3, limestone calcine clay cement, right? So in these two cases, obviously we went for different binder contents and water binder ratios to get the particular grade of concrete. Whereas in this mix, which is called a C mix, we had the same binder content and water binder ratio, okay? And you can see that with that, we are able to produce concretes of this 43 to 49 MPA strength. So more or less similar strength, except that LC3 is giving slightly higher strength as compared to fly ash based mixes, but not too much to emphasize on the strength. It's more the durability that we want to emphasize. So for these M30 and M50 mixes, if you look at the strength evolution or strength development, you don't see too much difference except that the LC3 systems seem to match with the OPC with respect to early strength. Whereas the flash based systems, which are in red here, start developing strength very slowly, but ultimately by one year, there's not much difference in the different blends. Okay, By one year, you really don't see too much difference. The difference is in durability. So if you compare the results of rapid chloride penetration test, RCPT, 
by ASTM C1202, you see here that the Portland cement mixes are always in this 2000 to 4000 region, irrespective of the type of concrete. Okay. The fly ash based material or uh, mixes have now come down to around 1000. And of course, in fly ash, if you cure for 28 days and then cure for 90 days, the enhancement in the durability is significant. That means the longer you cure, the better the durability gets with fly ash mixes. With LC3 mixes, even with 28 days curing, you're already in this negligible chloride penetration range, less than 100. So you can see it's a dramatic left effect as far as LC3 is concerned. Now, if you do a comparative study with this rapid migration test, okay, which is as per the Norwegian uh, standard NT492. So in this test, what you see is the non-steady state migration coefficient that is plotted on the x-axis. You see that the, for the OPC mixes, you have fairly high values. Fly ash is intermediate. And for LC3, you get very low levels of non-steady state migration coefficient. Those of you who are familiar with it, with this test will realize that getting a value of less than 2 into 10 power minus 12 is generally possible only with silica fume based high performance concrete mixes. And these are not high performance concrete. This is M30, M50 and a mix that produces a strength of about 45 megapascals. So it's, it's not at all high performance. This is producing high performance even though the strengths are regular strengths. So this is not HPC, but still it's able to produce durability which is comparable to what we expect in high performance concrete. Now, as far as chloride penetration characteristics are concerned, the direct bulk diffusion test, which is the true test for determination of chloride penetration, clearly shows that the amount of chlorides penetrating LC3 systems is much lower as compared to the fly ash systems, which is again much lower as compared to the cement systems, ordinary potent cement systems. So definitely there are significant advantages of utilizing LC3 in concrete with respect to chloride diffusion characteristics. Okay. So what about when we start making it in the field? Will it still give the same performance? So we wanted to test that. So we actually prepared slabs in field-like conditions. For a typical reinforced concrete slab, we did normal placement of the concrete, finishing, and then curing only for seven days. Okay, uh, Sorry, 14 days. The uh, moist curing was done using a jute or hessian cloth for 14 days, after which the concrete slabs were kept open to the environment and then tested after 28 days by taking these cores through the slabs. So the durability and strength tests were performed on the cores, which were taken from these slabs for slabs that were prepared with LC3 concrete and slabs that were prepared with fly ash concrete. So let's see how this fared. So for LC3, the field specimens, that means the specimens taken from the cores that were taken from the slab were compared with lab specimens. These were specimens that were cured in standard conditions in the laboratory. You see, there's not much difference. As far as RCPT is concerned, you still have this 160, 120. Migration coefficient is still less than two in both cases. Oxygen permeability is similar. Softivity may be a little bit different, but more or less you get the same durability, irrespective of whether you cure it in the lab or in the field. In the case of the fly ash based concrete, you see this difference here. Major difference, the lab specimens perform much better than in the field. So that means your fly ash based concrete is more susceptible to on-site curing as compared to LC3 based concretes. So that's the major benefit of utilizing LC3 over fly ash concrete for field applications. Now, of course, there's a lot more. I don't have the time here to really go through all the details with LC3, but several papers have come out of the research work that we have undertaken here on LC3 or limestone calcium clay cement. So I'm only giving you the publications here from IIT Madras dealing with LC3. There are, of course, a lot of other papers also that have come out based on LC3 technology from Europe, from IIT Delhi, and also from Australia. You should read this literature if you really are interested in the subject and would like to do further research on this specialty cement. Okay, now let's change gears and move to a local solution, right? So here we're talking about bagasse ash. Bagasse is nothing but the crushed cane after extraction of the sugar, it gives you these fibers, which we call as bagasse. And this bagasse has very nice calorific value. So it's usually burnt to obtain the, uh, the advantage of using, utilizing the heat for other processes in the sugar mill. 
So in this case, it is burnt typically in sugar mills at about 550 degrees Celsius. The resultant ash is simply called sugarcane bagasse ash. And that's what it looks like. You can see that it looks like a fine grain powder, but there are also these other fibrous looking materials present inside the bagasse ash. The fibers are obviously coming from these fibers that are present already in the bagasse. Okay. So what has been looked at in research previously has clearly shown that the finer powder that you get in the bagasse seems to have very high quality silica available. And this silica is in the amorphous form and that can lead to good reactivity in the cementitious uh, matrix, just like fly ash. Okay. So our aim here was to understand what would be the best way to utilize this material. What amount of processing would we need to do? How well do we need to actually further process this material to get the right quality? as far as cement replacement is concerned. But why is sugarcane bagasse ash so important? In India, if you really look at the, uh, the geography of the region, you see that there are several locations in India where sugarcane is produced in plenty of quantity. You have Punjab, Uttar Pradesh in the north, and then Maharashtra, and then Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Tamil Nadu in the south. These are major sugarcane producing centers in the country. And here, what happens is the amount of sugarcane that is produced also is directly related to the amount of bagasse ash that is ultimately dumped to the near, nearby areas. About 67,000 tons per day of bagasse ash is getting disposed. Okay, so you can imagine this is a major environmental problem because after burning it, they don't have any use of the ash. So they just dump it in the fields, right? So now what has happened is also that the uh, it has been mandated for sugar companies to also have what are called as co-generation plants. That means they should be able to, with the help of burning this bagasse ash, they should be now able to drive turbines and generate their own power and sometimes even supply excess power back to the grid. So in such cases, the bagasse ash generation is expected to grow further and further. Okay, So obviously something needs to be done to utilize this bagasse, bagasse ash. If you don't do that, obviously they'll start filling up more and more land with it and then we'll really run out of useful land which we can cultivate. So how do we find out whether this material is reactive or not? If you do an X-ray diffraction analysis, you can get a good understanding of the amorphous component that is present in the admixture, mineral admixture. There are obviously some crystalline species also like quartz and cristobalite that you can see in the bagasse ash, but mostly you see this large amorphous hump that indicates that a lot of the silica that is present inside the system may be of the kind that is amorphous and amorphous obviously means reactive. The difficulty in trying to use it directly is that you have an extremely high loss in ignition. You see here, the loss in ignition, that means what happens if you burn it to 1000 degrees Celsius, you still lose a lot of weight. And why is that weight going? Because you still have unburned carbon present in the bagasse ash. So about 21% of this material is getting lost in ignition. That means you have so much carbon that is present that is getting burnt off when you burn it to 1000 degrees Celsius. So what do we do about this? Is there a way to get rid of this unburned carbon? Is there a way to utilize this material in such a way that we minimize the amount of energy input that we give to really make it suitable for use? There are ways and that's what we were trying to find out in this research study. So for that, first we tried to understand what is the microstructure of this raw bagasse ash as it is collected from the site. So we went and collected bagasse ash from some sugar in plants uh, or sugar mills in the south of Tamil Nadu. And we then did scanning electron microscopy study to try and understand what are the different morphologies that we can see in this material. You can see here that the material has a combination of fibrous particles, irregular shaped particles, and more regular prismatic or spherical particles. So obviously, when you start seeing prismatic or spherical, you know that there is some degree of shape that has been obtained by the material. And this shape, especially prismatic, is resultant from crystalline sort of materials that are present in the system. The fibrous particles, you can try and attribute to your carbon-based materials, but you still need to confirm it. And that's what we did with energy, energy dispersal spectroscopy. The irregular particles are the ones we are interested in because those are the silica particles, again, established through energy dispersal spectroscopy. So essentially, your raw bagasse ash is composed of this fine powder, which are basically the fine burnt silica particles. You have the coarse fibrous particles, which are of 10 millimeter size, and you have the fine fibrous particles, which are of one millimeter size. So these both particles need to be removed from your system to really get a better performance from your bagasse ash. 
So how do you remove it is the question. So we went through a large range of techniques for removal. Obviously, when carbon is present, one way to remove is by burning. Further, as I said earlier, in sugarcane plants, typically the burning happens at 550 degrees Celsius. So we went and attempted burning for higher levels of temperatures, 600, 700, 800, 900. When you start going towards 900, what happens is the silica starts recrystallizing and forming other crystalline components that pushes down the reactivity. We wanted a minimum pozzolanic activity from this material. So we said that, okay, burning up to 700 degrees may be good enough to produce a good quality material. But burning involves a lot of energy expenditure. Can we cut that down somehow? So then what we did was we found that the sieving of the material through 300 micron sieve was sufficiently enough to actually get the activity index to the minimum requirement. Sieving and then burning further extended that performance even more. And interestingly, sieving and grinding to cement fineness. That's what you would expect when you actually take this bagasse hash and mix with the clinker and put it in the ball mill, the grinding will lead to the production of uniform sizes. Okay, Of course, that depends on the hardness, relative hardness, but then a siliceous material like bagasse hash or silica and bagasse ash may not have that much difference in hardness as compared to your regular calcium silicates that you have in the cement. So when you do that, when you just sieve and grind, you get a pozzolanic activity that is more than 100%, indicating that you nearly get cement-like performance with up to 25, 20% uh, 20 of cement replaced by bagasse ash. And that's really a tremendous performance that you can expect for processed bagasse ash. So you take bagasse ash as collected, as available from your dump sites, you dry it obviously to, because when they dump this ash, they all, always mix it with water to ensure that the, the dry powder does not fly away. That will cause health hazards, right? So you bring it, dry it, and then sieve it through a 300 micron sieve that gets rid of your fibrous carbon. What remains is your nice powdered silica. What you simply do is you crush it to a size which is equivalent to that of cement. About 300 square meters per kilogram is typically the size that we did in our research studies. And we found that that material in combination with cement produced nearly 100% effect. Okay, So that's what we went with as far as uh, using blended cements with SCBA are concerned. We made blends with 5%, 10%, 15%, 20%, 25%, 25% replacement of cement with Pegas ash. The reason obviously is 5%, you can still use it as a performance improver. At 25%, you can think about utilization as a Portland pozzolan cement. The intermediate values were just to understand what happens as we keep on changing the uh, the content of bagasse ash as a replacement of cement. So we went with a common mix design for all the different types of cementitious blends. The cement content was 360, water binder ratio is 0.45 and post to fine aggregate ratio is 60 to 40. We did conventional curing, moist curing for 28 days and 56 days. And conditioning was done for the durability tests as per the regular procedures. You can see there's not much effect on strength as we change the bagasse ash content. So at 5, 15, 25% bagasse ash, the strength is within 5 to 10% of your control strength. Higher or lower does not really matter. Okay, Mostly, they are within the same range as your conventional concrete or control concrete with just OPC. Okay, So that means that your Bagasse is performing at a level which is equivalent to the cement. We did a lot of different durability test methods. And I'm going to present some of the results that are uh, from these methods. Of course, I'm also showing you the, the uh, specimen preparation that is captured in the slide. Most of these are common for several of the durability techniques. So what, what you see here are the results of uh, the charge passed in coulombs with the replacement level. So when I replace up to 5%, I marginally reduce the charge pass. So I'm not really making a major difference to the dur durability, but still I'm cutting down cement usage. So that's obviously a major impact. When we go to 15 or 25%, we have brought down the perform or we have brought down the chloride charge pass to a significantly low level, very low level. And this is a performance which you expect again with very good quality fly ash. Okay. Similarly, chloride conductivity index, which is another index test that is done as per a South African method, shows clearly that when you replace cement with bagasse ash, you see a decline in conductivity. Lower conductivity means better durability. 
oxygen permeability index is plotted here, which is basically the negative logarithm of the permeability coefficient. So if the permeability coefficient is very low, your permeability index value is going to be high. So the higher the value, the better the concrete. You can see from as compared to control, all the concretes with Begas ash seem to give you a much higher OPI value, index value, which means that you have produced a concrete that is of good quality with respect to gas permeability. Again, another air permeability test, which is called the torrent air permeability test was done for all the blends. And you see here again that the permeability coefficient, which is plotted here, reduces as you increase the level of replacement of cement by the gas ash. What, when a resistivity, so higher resistivity or lower conductivity means better concrete quality. Again, you can see very clearly that the resistivities of the blended cement concretes is definitely better as compared to controlled concrete. So again, all the durability results seem to point out to the fact that your Begas ash based concrete is superior to your ordinary potent cement based systems. Again, water penetration depth, another positive result, you can clearly see that the penetration depth goes down as you increase the replacement level of the Begas ash. So again, all of this research is captured in several papers that we brought out. Uh, uh, you can go through these if you're interested in Begas ash. There is a lot of so work that still remains to be done, for instance, the shrinkage of materials or shrinkage of concrete with Vegas ash, the structural performance, all these things have yet to be, uh, be explored. I think these are very important that we understand how all these properties of concrete are also affected by Vegas ash so that we can maximize the utilization wherever Vegas ash is available aplenty. So just to round up my discussion, one of the major challenges of new supplementary materials, for example, like sugarcane bagasse ash, is to estimate the available amounts. We need to also look at what kind of processing is necessary. And to understand what processing is necessary, it's very important that we do a full-scale characterization of the material. You saw earlier that with bagasse ash, our processing could be made successful because we were able to isolate the different types of species that were found within the material. If we had just randomly gone for only burning or only grinding, we may not have got the required result, okay? What we need to do is assess the cost of doing this kind of a strategy or a, of, of an evaluation and then justify the cost, okay? And the performance of such new SEMs has to be established in different types of concrete. It's not possible to just establish performance in one concrete and simply say that it works fine everywhere. One needs to look at all the types of concrete characteristics. Standardization is the next step. One has to achieve some level of performance and confidence in that level of performance in order to push the material up to the standards committees and get it included in the list of available alternatives that you can use in concrete. For instance, in IS456, they have a section where they, should, they say that these are the materials that you are allowed to use as pozzolanic replacements or other fillers instead of ordinary potent cement. And generally, of course, after standardization comes the mass production and use. So I should also tell you that the standard for LC3 or limestone calcium clay cement is in the making. It should be out within the next half a year. Okay. And after that, you'll see a lot of commercial manufacture of the LC3. All the results that I showed you were from a trial manufacture of the LC3. So in the future, you'll start seeing LC3 also as an available option in the commercial, uh, commercially available cements. So just to summarize, as I said, binder choices can be local or global, depending upon the availability of the material. You definitely need to incentivize people who are using these materials, ensure that there are policies and incentives that are put in place to promote the use of such materials. Processing is the main challenge. When you start thinking about utilizing new materials, make sure that you characterize them well and understand what are the processing techniques that are necessary to really involve them as cemetery placements and your sustainability impact assessment that you do for the material. It's not just that you've stopped using cement so your concrete is more sustainable. It's not like that. The alternative material that you're proposing as a replacement should be capable of bringing down the overall CO2 and energy that is associated with OPC. Only then it is green or sustainable. It's not simply enough to say that replace cement, it becomes sustainable. No, you need to calculate these costs that are involved in processing properly before you justify these materials to be used in concrete. And of course, you definitely need to establish the impact on concrete locally because the sources of materials and the qualities of materials differ locally. 
So all this requires a large amount of study taken up at a national scale. So thank you all very much. You can definitely reach out to me at the end of the session for questions or if you have specific doubts about the content that was presented or if you'd like to get some of these research papers for your own use, you can contact me by email at manus at civil.iitm.ac.in. I also have put together uh, some of my lectures as well as papers on this website, Concrete Portal. I urge you to explore the content that is available and if you have any doubts, you can always reach out to me. So thank you all very much. It's been a pleasure sharing my talk with you and I'll end my talk here. Thank you. Bye.